Joe, you know, sometimes in talking to you, I've, I've been with you once or twice now, and I think you have to... You better explain you've been with me on the air. On the air, yeah. uh, on your television. <laughs> on your television show, and I think sometimes you have to work awfully hard to find something to complain about. Let because... me give you... Let, just to show you I'm not nitpicking with this lady, listen to some advice she gives in this book, Outrageous Opinions. He's talking now to a lonesome female... I don't know whether I can... Well, I'll try. She says, one way to spend a Saturday night alone is to put on some records, jazz, classical, or cha-cha-cha, pull down the shades, and dance naked for a couple of hours. What is so outrageous about that? Helen, they're going to send you to the funny farm. I go to work every day and spend the entire day at my office. I'm called editor-in-chief of the international editions of Cosmopolitan, and I look through Cosmopolitan very carefully every month because it's somewhat different from my formula because it's, uh, it's got more to do with, with sex. It's really quite seriously sexy. <laughs> Which one is this? This is the latest edition of Norwegian Cosmo. This is the first time we have tried the green color. What would you say this page is? It's, it's like hot or not. Mm. This is totally different than the picture on the cover. Mm. For me, that's a good, good article. Helen has a mind like a steel trap and a will of iron. She is one of the very few originals. The biggest problem with Helen is you can never get to your office fast enough to send her a thank you note. She always beat you to it. Always with loves and kisses and always dear pussy cat. Um, and always thanking me when I should be thanking her, when all of us should be thanking Helen for what she's done for all of us. I've been writing letters long before I was a teenager, and I'm such a good typist, I can type 80 words a minute. I write on this typewriter, which is a Royal Manual typewriter, and there's one out there that's a spare. When this one breaks down, then I've got one that I can still use. And <clears throat> I don't like online particularly. I mean, there are probably more than a dozen people in this company who have kept every letter they've ever gotten from Helen Gurley Brown. We will publish someday an anthology of Helen's letters because, you know, in the, in the age of the internet, that kind of writing is going to, unfortunately going to disappear. These are truly unique jewels about somebody who knew that the printed word, the written word, was a way to communicate in a permanent way that nothing else can come close to. You know, Helen lives sort of with one foot in the past. She doesn't let herself forget the deprivations and the things that I think she truly suffered through as a, in her family life. I was 10 years old when my father was crushed in the elevator in the Little Rock State Capitol building. 10 years old. He didn't leave us any money and my sister managed to get polio. And I wrote to Franklin Roosevelt, who was the President of the United States at that time, Dear Mr. President, my sister Mary has polio just like you, and I know she would love to hear from you. He wrote her a letter. It says, My dear Mary, your sister told me that you had polio and would like to hear from me. That's hanging up in the hallway in my house. One of the things Helen would try to do for her sister was to find the best foam that was in the marketplace to create cushions for the wheelchair for her sister to sit in. 
when I was with my mother in Little Rock, Arkansas. She encouraged me to get in there and compete. And in Sunday school, they gave you a bunch of verses that you were supposed to look up, and whoever looked up the most of them won a prize. And who do you suppose won that prize? <laughs> She believed in my brain. Well, little girls weren't supposed to have brains. If they did, they weren't supposed to worry about them. In the 30s in Little Rock, Arkansas, you're supposed to be pretty and fluffy. It's all because of my mother. So something that she didn't do was tell me that I looked okay. She never said to me, honey, you're pretty. Never! Because <laughs> she didn't think so. She said I resembled my father. Oh, <laughs> him. <laughs> He's over there on the table over there. She didn't like him very much, so that wasn't a compliment. Spent a lot of time as a secretary when she was really a very talented copywriter. I had 17 secretarial jobs. <laughs> you know, with those 17 secretarial jobs, I mean, that's, you have to be resilient. You have to really be a tough girl. You have to keep on keeping on, as they say. I worked for a man one year who was the head of an advertising agency, Foot, Cone, and Building, and I worked for Mr. Building in Los Angeles. Glamour Magazine had a contest called 10 Girls with Taste. I filled out the questionnaire. The head of the personnel department called my boss, Don Building, in California. She's here in New York. She said, Mr. Building, your secretary would like to be a copywriter. She doesn't want to be just a secretary the rest of her life. Is there anything you could do to move that along? The men copywriters hated me. They even talked about me to Don Belding. They said, this little creep, we have a family, we have children, we're normal people. She's sitting down here at the office at eight o'clock at night because she doesn't have anybody and she's making us look bad. I was involved with quite a few different men. I wasn't close to marrying one of them. They weren't the right people for me to be married to. And nobody pounded me over the head and said, you've got to be my wife. So I didn't get married. I heard that David Brown was getting a divorce. And I said to one of my friends who knew his wife, I said, I'd like to meet him. I think she had her sights on hooking David as well she should have. And I think she took every last cent she had, every nickel she had, and she went out and she bought a Mercedes for herself because she thought that it would be appealing and sexy to him to say, hmm, who is this chick with the Mercedes? And she hooked him. He said, that's a nice car. I said, I know, and I paid cash for that car. He said he never knew a woman who paid cash for a car to bobby pins, let, let alone an automobile, let alone a Mercedes Benz. So he said, would you like to go out later this week? I said, yes. Well, the French call it a coup de foudre. You know, you, you see somebody and that's it. And that was it for me. But one night at his house in Pacific Palisades, I'm having dinner there and he and his housekeeper are running around upstairs and downstairs with fabric samples, I realized they weren't consulting me because obviously they didn't think I was ever going to live there. And I'd been with David over a year and a half by that point. And that night when he took me home, I said, David, bye-bye. I love you and I'm going to miss you but I don't want to hear from you unless you ask me to get married. I couldn't find her. I sent out St. Bernard's with flasks of brandy. No Helen. I finally tracked her down and, and said in that most romantic uh, of expressions, I surrender, dear. Then he came over and we started talking about getting married. But he had to be bashed in the head. But that, that's we've had a good... That's a true version. Okay. He is her knight in shining armor, her stunned admirer, her perennial lover, you know, all of that. And she, she is equally very involved with him and 
she's a wonderful wife to him, I think. I, I mean, I don't know how they manage this, but uh, they're the two people I think about in, in the eternity walking into the clouds holding hands. Helen doesn't love to dance that much with David, so I always ask David to dance at one of those black tie dinners that we go to, and he's a great dancer. So she's off dancing with somebody else, and I get to dance with David. Then she comes up and says, don't get too close to him. So I think she's very jealous, or she wants him to know that she's jealous. Unlike some uh, marriages where the woman is very prominent, very often the man plays a supporting role, but the man is not always the accomplished person that David Brown is, who is a giant uh, in his own industry. I think it's, an, it's kind of a nice thing to be married to a successful woman. It's a great aphrodisiac when a woman is smart. Mention sex and the single girl is I'm a working girl in an advertising agency. I came home to my new husband one night and I said, David, I'm going to be fired. Could you think of a book I could write? You've helped other people write books. He said, why don't you write about being single? He said, you were like no other single woman I ever met. You were never home. I said, David, I was home. I had the phone in the refrigerator, so I couldn't hear it ring. If I heard it ring, I would have answered it. And you know I'm not the belle of the ball. I'm home alone on Saturday night. He said, well, write about that. I suggested that she write a book about her life as a single woman, because she described it to me very often. And uh, it seemed to me a good idea. Sex and a single girl. She wrecks. Helen was the first author to do tours. She went around the country. She was on television. She did all that. Sometimes a man does spend the night. Uh, I don't think it's uh, sensible to say that these things don't go on. I know they do go on. The book was a pretty big bestseller because it said a couple of things that hadn't been said. One was that you didn't have to be married to have a good life. And in the early, I mean, in the 40s and 50s, you were supposed to have a husband. But I simply said, you don't have to have a husband to have a good life. And the second thing I said, which was more important, was that sex didn't belong to them, the men. I said, you don't go to bed just because they want to. Single girls weren't supposed to have sex, but I knew better because I'd been a single girl until I was 37 years old and stopped being a prim, prissy little single girl when I was about 19. So I'd had a little experience in there and I knew that single girls were interested in sex and they knew how to uh, involve themselves. I couldn't believe what I was reading. Of course, once I got over the shock, I started dancing around the room saying to myself, gee, that's great, that's just how I feel. But I've never been able to admit it. I wrote it to help the unmarried women in this country to stop being ashamed of sex or being single. And I want them to stop behaving like mice and stop behaving like men. At that point in time, this was the 60s, women were just really getting a little bit of sense that they could have this freedom and that they could have the life they wanted, their fair share of life and then some more. After I was on the Today Show, I got just dozens of letters there all over the place. I'm typing and answering everybody. He said, Helen, if you had a magazine, you could answer everybody at one time. And we didn't know any better. We just sat down at the kitchen sink and, and uh, did up a format for a magazine for young women. I took it around all, to, all around town to sell it. I wasn't working at the time. I was unemployed. I took it to everyone. I, and finally, my pal John O'Connell and I used to have lunch at a restaurant called Sardi's East. And I said, what's going on at Hearst? And he said, I, I, they're thinking of burying Cosmo. Well, a light went on in my head and through Bernard Geis, we, 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 we prepared, we took our dummy, he sheaked it up a little, tarted it up, made it look a little better, and uh, he sent it to Dick Deems, whom he knew from Esquire, and Dick looked at it, and 24 hours later, we were in the Waldorf Towers talking to Dick Deems about taking over Cosmo. 
since it was about to die, Dick Deems, who was then the head of the magazine company, sort of uh, said, okay, this, we're going to close it, and let's see if it works. I had never set foot in a magazine office before, and all of a sudden I'm going to be the editor-in-chief of a big national magazine. I don't know what we, we, how we pushed her into this thing, but we got her into Hearst and we got her into, the, into Cosmo. I went to the company, sat in an office, just to kind of used my common sense to try to figure out how to be a magazine editor. I decided maybe I'd better see who was working on the magazine already. So I went around and visited all of them. Everybody who was left, some of them already went bye-bye. When they heard I was going to be the editor, they didn't want to be there. But some of them were left and I decided which ones should stay and which ones should not be there. We all assumed we had lost our jobs, that she would make a clean sweep. <laughs> And uh, into my office one day, I was going to resign to save her the trouble of having to fire me, came this adorable, this sort of frail little woman. And she was so sweet. And she said something like, uh, oh, Liz, what are we going to do with you? And I thought, oh, well, wait a minute, here's my resignation. She said, we want you to stay on. I just love your writing, blah, blah. So I almost faded from shock. Then I thought I'd better look at the stuff that they already had created that they were gonna put in the magazine. I read that very carefully. Just used my common sense and I said, this is about 18 times too long. Nobody's gonna read a magazine article like that. So it can't be that long. And some of it was just plain crummy and terrible. I said, we can't use that. There was one manuscript that was really superb, but it was about that fat, and it had to do with uh, sex. It was successful immediately because of a cover blurb I wrote. The pill that makes women more responsive to men. They made her take off the last two words, and so it was the pill that makes women more responsive. But every woman apparently knew what it was. It was birth control. Cosmo immediately flew off the newsstand, had a 100% sell through, and we were profitable from day one. Cosmo is so successful because it has universal appeal. Cosmopolitan sells over two million copies a month on the newsstand. It's the largest selling newsstand magazine in the United States. She didn't realize it. But she was an editor, you know, a nat natural born editor. Her ability to dissect stories too long, too short, do this, do that. That was her talent, mm -hmm. but she'd never realized it because she'd never been in a magazine, and I doubt that she read any. Helen has taught me editing is about good sense, and it's, it's not about focus groups, and it's not about, uh, listen, when she started editing Cosmo, there, were no, there wasn't an internet, there wasn't this, this whole system of finding out what the reader is thinking. And she would always say that you have to go with your gut, and if it makes sense, if it makes good sense, then go with it. I always believed that she had an individual person in mind when she edited. She wasn't editing to a class of people, or to a group of people, or to all 23 years old. She had a singular young woman in mind, and she kind of, as an author of, uh, of a novel might do, lived through that person and fleshed out that person and edited for her. This was the Cosmo Girl look. I said, we're not gonna show the girl next door or the girl who works in the library or the one who sells notions in a department store. We're gonna show a girl that everybody would like to look at. Francesco Scavullo, his associate Sean Burns, did everything and <clears throat> they knew how to push bosoms up and push bosoms out and they would stuff a bra with bobby socks, <laughs> Kleenex, paper towels, anything it took to get the bosom to show off a little bit more and Francesco was in favor of doing that because he was smart. He knew what would sell magazines. And I was always telling her I hated the Francesco Scavullo covers and I wanted her to do this, do that. And we had big arguments always about what was tasteful and common. And 
this is typical Helen. She would say to me, Lizzie, I know you don't like the covers. And I know you want the covers to be glamorous girls running through the woods with their hair streaming behind them, like in European magazines like Nova. Well, I'll tell you, as soon as our sales fall off, at the newsstands, I'll change the covers. And I never got my way. <laughs>
It is 10 degrees out. The winds are blowing. She and David are waiting for the bus. So I walk up to her and I said, Helen, we're parking our car. Helen, what are you doing here waiting for the bus? She opens her hand. She has two quarters in her hand. And she said, I'm, I said, Helen, there are taxis going back and forth. I will not spend the money for a taxi. It is freezing here, Helen. I'm not paying for a taxi. I remember one night I went up to her apartment to have dinner. She said, my, you got here in a hurry. And I said, well, I took a cab. She said, you take cabs? Next thing I know, I see her. I say, Helen, are you taking taxis? She was going to work on the bus. And she said, well, I take a taxi one way and I take the bus home. I'm a little bit thrifty. My husband says I'm cheap. You are cheap. You are <laughs> well, cheap. Well, that's the end of that question and answer. <laughs> well, she would sometimes remove tips I left in hotel rooms. She would cut them down before we left until I got on to it. I had just been with her to Hermes where she bought a $75 tie, and that was in the days when $75 was a lot of money. So I said, Helen, you just paid $75 for a tie. She said, oh yeah, but that was a business expense for some friend of David's. But I can't spend this kind of money on me. On me. I mean, he doesn't know anything about tens or fives or ones. He only deals in twenties. Ah! Hmm. Well, so much for that. But she never did any of this with arrogance. She always did it because she felt the price needed to be right. So you see, she's still frugal and she's still a little girl from Arkansas who's a little bit worried that it may all disappear. <laughs> Helen has had an effect on the whole society in terms of how she perceived women's lives in general, not just in the workplace, but their personal relationships, etc. And I believe, although she isn't always listed uh, among them, that there was never a greater feminist and that she did more to change what the world of women is like today than almost anybody that I can think of, with all due respect to the names that get associated with the feminist movement. Most people don't recognize that Helen Brown is a feminist, that she has always fought for the empowerment of women to decide what they do in their life and what kind of life they will lead. She had a lot of arguments with Gloria Steinem and other leaders of the movement because they were more purists and Helen didn't, she, she thought that everybody, women should have it all. You can be a success and you can have a great guy and there's no reason that being a successful woman precludes you from having a guy. And that was a message that real women related to. It really resonated for them. You know, when I hear the word feminism, for me, it means, you know, embracing and loving women. And if there's anyone in this world that has embraced women and has loved women, has created a magazine and a lifestyle for women, it's Helen. I don't know whether Gloria Steinem wants me to say that I'm a feminist, but never mind whether she wants me to. I am a feminist. I totally respect what she has done. You have given women some of their humanity back by giving them their sexuality back. To say that women were sexual people in 20 years ago uh, took quite a lot of courage. There was a point in time where I think Cosmo was for that girl lived down the hall from you in college who was just a little bit edgier than you, a little bit more of a risk taker. But now that's who women mainstream are. What has happened is that she has been redeemed. Women have come now to where Helen thought they should have been 20 years ago. You can be strong, you can be smart, and you can wear your blouse button opened just a little bit lower than everybody else and still be considered a feminist. She opened up doors for us. I mean, I was a woman that, that came through doors thanks to Helen Gurley Brown because she made people understand that women had tremendous determination, tremendous ambition, and we would work our tushes off. And that's what Helen did. Times change, but Cousin Fulton has helped them do that. Around 1980, I'm going to guess, or I was sitting in my little office at Cosmo, and I was staying late, and I heard a little bit of screaming back in Helen's area. 
between Helen and the then executive editor. He was leaving to be promoted to a much bigger position at Hearst. And while she was very happy that he got the job, and she probably helped him get that job, she did not want him to take his assistant. They were screaming back and forth and back and forth, and I thought it was over when all of a sudden Helen ran down the hall where I was. He ran after her. It reversed. He ran first. She ran after him. I thought what I better do is duck, because if they saw me, it would be terrible. She would be so embarrassed that I had overheard all this screaming and yelling. So I got down under my desk. In the morning, I went on to her and I said, is everything fine? She said, oh, everything's fine. I said, was everything okay with you last night? She said, oh, yes. I said, she said, did you hear any of that? I said, might have heard a little. Is that okay? She said, of course it's okay. You have to fight for what you want. One of the great things about Helen is her, uh, her discipline. She used to come visit me in the Hamptons and I was living with a guy and we had a house that was built like a boxcar. It wasn't an elegant house, but it was right on the water and it was beautiful. And uh, the weekends that Helen was there visiting us, we had to get up at six because Helen was shaking the house to the timbers. She was up exercising. <laughs> we said, Helen, it's the weekend. I mean, I remember being on an airplane with Helen. We were going to Australia and uh, she needed to exercise. It's a very long flight, you know, it's 21 hours. She needed to exercise, so she basically got up in the middle of the, the corridor, you know, the aisle, and started to exercise, you know, doing her, you know, leg lifts and, you know. The home of where the wind comes sweeping down the plain. She loves uh, Oklahoma, and she loves uh, all of the, the tunes from Broadway. I'm a little concerned about being as old as I am, and I'm not very philosophical about it. If I'm lucky, I'm gonna get even older. <laughs> and I can't see anything really wonderful about being old. Well, you know I have a Walter Wall leopard carpet in my office, and Walter Wall leopard carpet in our apartment. I have a fake leopard coat her name is Jezebel. <laughs> the last lifetime I may have been a leopard. Leopard? Who sings that song that you were singing? The song you were just humming, singing. Bye bye baby. Bye bye baby. Bye, bye, baby. Bye, baby. Remember you're my baby when they give you the eye. Mm -hmm. Though you'll be gone for a while, won't you write and declare? Though on the loose you are still on the square, mm -hmm. I'll be gloomy. But send that rainbow to me and my troubles will fly. Though you'll be gone for a while, I know that I'll be smiling with my baby by When it came time to have a younger editor, the head of the company came to see me and I said something along the line of, what are you doing here? <laughs> and he explained that it was time to have a younger editor for Cosmopolitan because I was already in my 70s and the reader of Cosmo is between the ages of 18 and 34. She and David, and for that matter certainly, I knew uh, that as my day to move on would come, so too would Helen's. But she pulled me aside and she said to me, you know, honey, um, my last issue is gonna be November. Uh, she confided in a few friends, some who were fairly prominent, uh, like Barbara Walters, and. Uh, and others, and also friends of mine, and I got a little feedback that was not altogether flattering to me that uh, this giant uh, had uh, been asked to take on a new role. But that didn't last long, and Helen handled it beautifully herself, and I think didn't fully realize what she knows today, and that was that she was gonna have a fulfilling and active career on out into the future, which wouldn't have been possible if she'd been focusing only on uh, coming every day and editing the magazine. It's not usual for a public company to keep people who are older. They send them away. But in my company, they let me continue to have a job. 
Are you going to say one, two, three, snap, or are you just going to snap away? I'm just going to snap away. Just going to snap away? Yeah. Well, I guess I shouldn't be talking. I should just be. I should be scintillating. Yes, scintillating in your mind. That can be a verb. Oh, we definitely I think want I'll to scintillate. Please. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful, I love that. That's great. Is she is she doing it now? Yes. 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 Are you doing it? Yes. Oh my god, that's so <laughs> precious. Even reaching towards the lens, because I'm cropping your hands out. Can we look at the camera? Yes, please. Beautiful. Oh <laughs> beautiful. Beautiful. <laughs> beautiful. Absolutely stunning. I may look better when I'm smiling. Actually, you know all Julie, if you could manage to be funny. Oh my. Okay. <laughs> Just this once. Just this is the one. I think Helen came to Hearst at an urgent time from the standpoint of the company. She gets to go down along with uh, all the chief executives and the founder uh, as among the most important people in the history of this company. I remember the first time that I met Helen and it was in an elevator at the 224 building and she came in the elevator and I was in there already and she immediately started asking me questions and she said, oh you have such beautiful posture, where did you get that posture from? She makes you feel good about yourself. She doesn't make you feel bad about yourself and there's no better confidence builder than having a superstar like Helen Burley Brown trust you. Someone on my staff will come in and say, I was on the elevator today and Helen Gurley Brown told me I have great shoes. I think they are struck by, by uh, her, her just interest in other people and staying in touch with young people and she might sort of ask, where'd you buy those or pick their brain a little bit. There's no one whose relationship uh, I value more highly than my relationship with Helen and that remains today and will be always thus. Helen has always said to me, when right is on your side, just go for it. And what she means by that is, when you feel that you're doing the right thing, the honest thing, you're going to win at the end. And I think it's true. I think she's, you know, the steel hand in the velvet glove. But she's tenacious, that's for sure. And I think that uniqueness, that ability, that willingness to be only herself and not what somebody else created, will be what all of us who knew her remember. What's she, what's she really like? She's like Helen. <laughs> <laughs>